All right, welcome back. We have been joined by our friends from the Ministry of Forest, uh, Forestry, Fisheries and Environment. We have with us this morning uh, Dr. Percival Cho. Good morning, sir. He's the Forest Officer at the Forestry Department, Marlene. Mm -hmm. We're also joined by Mr. Wilbur Sabido, the Chief Forest Officer with the Forestry Department as well. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. So let's get into our conversation for today. And what we're looking at are the amendments uh, that are going to come into effect uh, for the forest bill. And I want to start off by finding out uh, just how long it has been since you have made any amendments to this bill. We know it is quite the practice in Belize that a lot of our laws are antiquated. Uh, they're slap on the wrist for offenses that are now seen uh, to be very prevalent. So let's just talk about a bit of the history. Well, uh, it's, the law has been there even before I was born. Of course. Uh, and so we're talking about in excess of 40 years as far as I, I am concerned. <laughs> but really, it dates back to the 1920s. Uh, in the, it was revised slightly in the 1950s and in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, uh, the changes to the law have been very minimal. Mm -hmm. They haven't been substantive in the sense of addressing some of the key issues as it pertains to licenses, but more importantly in terms of penalties and fines associated with forest crimes. Yeah. So uh, what we did uh, earlier this year really was to, to, to revise the penalties and the fines associated with forest crimes. And, and for us, that is a major milestone. Yeah. In other words, you are trying to make the law have more teeth. Uh, it, it's more punitive in terms of uh, if you do partake in these activities, then you will have to pay for it, not uh, uh, chum change like we, we've been seeing before. But uh, let, let's talk about addressing the larger issue here before we talk about the changes in the penalties. We have seen uh, for a very long time illegal logging uh, become a serious problem in Belize. You were telling us before the break, uh, before we started, that it is one of the most common uh, criminal activities to take place. Let, let's talk a bit about that. Yes. Um Belize is no exception in as far as timber, illegal timber harvest is concerned. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned that it is the fourth largest organized crime globally mm -hmm. uh, in excess of $20, 25000000000 billion, um, where uh, the, the illegal timber is really used to, 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 as a money laundering sort of activity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it extends beyond timber. It, it goes into armed smuggling. It goes into human trafficking. So it, it, it is a, a varied network of individuals that are working together in order for them to perpetrate the illegal uh, timber harvest. So Belize is really no exception. We're, we're simply the, the microcosm of what occurs elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and in Belize, we have seen um, quite a prevalence in terms of, of illegal logging. Um, it is very insidious. Um, uh, one of the, of the issues is that illegal harvest occurs in these large forest areas mm -hmm. and what is what is occurring is that illegal loggers tend to uh, focus on the larger nicer sized species but more specifically we're talking about mahogany rosewood cedar mm -hmm. um, those um, because we're we're putting our finger on on those species they are starting to focus on other species so what is happening is that by focusing on on these individual species what occurs is that the forest then becomes degraded. Mm. And then that has its own ramifications. Mm -hmm. I don't know that. Yeah, and um, in addition to that, the, there's a few timber species that have been exploited uh, to a point where they're almost commercially, we call it, extinct. Mm -hmm. And that means that even though you have many of these trees out in the forest, they're very small. Yeah. They're not large enough to provide timber. So we've almost reached a point with some of these species where you might not see them on the market anymore, like lovely wood like granadillo, for example, mm -hmm. um, hobillo, for example. We, were, we might not get those available uh, on the market in the coming years. Mm -hmm. um, it's not to say, like I said, it's just completely wiped out. It's not yeah. extinction, it's just commercial, commercial extinction. We're almost there. Let's start with the issue of rosewood, because I think that's been one that mm -hmm. has been followed by the media for quite a while. 
Um, we know the limitations that are set in terms of harvesting rosewood in Belize, but yet it still continues to happen. Now, my question is, we're not talking about smuggling an artifact in a bag. We're not talking about taking something that can be hidden mm -hmm. in any way, shape, or form. So I, I suppose one of the queries that the public continuously has is, how is it possible to remove timber from the country that shouldn't have been harvested in the first place? Well, um, several things here. Uh, we recognize that it was a huge problem. Mm -hmm. um, it, there were several factors in the equation that actually led to these vast amounts of, of rosewood being harvested. And, and you're quite right. Uh, with the ability of the uh, exporters to be able to, to export the material. And that was done uh, with the uh, knowledge of the government of the government of the forest department but what has happened since then really is that uh, we recognize not only in Belize but in the region the importance of the species mm -hmm. um, and so there have been two major milestones that have taken place in order for us regionally and globally to address the problem mm -hmm. and locally uh, Belize is a member or signatory of the Convention of International Trade of Endangered Species of right. Fauna and Flora, mm -hmm. CITES. Mm -hmm. And so in 2013, actually Belize introduced a proposal to the parties that are signatory to CITES to enlist three uh, species of rosewood. And we had overwhelming support mm -hmm. at a global forum. And so what that meant is that rosewood then at least the species that exist in Belize and exist in Guatemala and Mexico, we're able to now regulate the trade of it in the sense that if you notice after 2013, that is when we saw almost a dead stop, a dead halt in terms of the export of, of rosewood. Just last year in December, Mexico and Guatemala introduced a much larger or, or blanket um, um, proposal where they're saying, well, let's not only focus on three rosewood species. Let's focus on all the rosewood species. And so what we're having now is that now the global community is saying, listen, this is a clear and present problem. It has continued. We need to stop for the very reason that what Dr. Cho is saying in terms of commercial extinction. And that is a, a marker mm -hmm. because when you start moving from commercial extinction into now complete extinction of that particular species, then that means that we'll have a you know, um, um, a species that has gone wiped off the face of... Let me ask a question. I, I, I don't uh, intend to challenge you guys mm -hmm. deliberately or put your backs against the wall. But looking at the fact that there has now been this move to amend the existing legislation, shouldn't this have been the priority several years ago as opposed to... to several years ago to deal with the issue of illegal harvesting of rosewood as opposed to the knee jerk or the symbolic action of burning for instance i think how do you how do you contextualize that because i see that a move like this would seemingly make more sense mm -hmm. in terms of putting a hand or getting a handle of the situation versus an impulsive reaction for instance mm -hmm. how do you contextualize that sure um we we, we were we looked at it from from two two levels one the fact that at the, at <coughs> we had a situation at the local level and we also had bigger players in the export market making that demand of this particular species. Um, certainly, uh, when we were there at the time, we were looking at how it is that we would revise the law. Okay. Um, until now, um, certainly the, the, the environment has changed. Um, and fortunately, uh, we do have very strong political will at this particular point in time through uh, the Honorable Minister um, Omar Figueroa and he was insistent that this would be one of the, the, the main things that we need to do in order for us to not have a revisit of exactly what you mentioned yeah. in, the, in the instance of the, of the Rosewood phenomena. And so we went back and actually um, um, through the, the, the very um, uh, detailed eye of, of, of Dr. Cho, we actually were able to now revise the law and make it more applicable. Um, certainly, uh, 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 we recognize that um, it's not 
we don't want it to, to seem as though we're sweeping the Rosewood situation under the rug. But what we're saying is that, listen, um, we don't want that particular situation to happen again. And we are taking the necessary steps in order for us to ensure that it does not happen again. And mm -hmm. if caught, you can do more to them. Right, right. And let me add to that, um, just by the nature of the business, law enforcement usually lags behind uh, criminal activities, mm -hmm. uh, e even in, in, in illegal logging. So we've been, uh, I would say, several years working on these um, amendments. Mm -hmm. And it's just recently, like, like Wilbur had mentioned, that there is no political support. Um, uh, picture this, like in other countries or, or neighboring countries, uh, when it comes to the environment, they pass laws almost uh, on a monthly basis. Yeah. Right? And, and they're in some countries, like uh, in the U.S., for example, um, there's now a move to, for every new law, you repeal two. Mm -hmm. right? So you, know, you sort of reduce that, that legislative burden. Yeah. Here in this country, uh, like we mentioned, the, the Forest Act hasn't been revived since about 1995, right? the last revision. Mm -hmm. So we're very, especially slow here in meeting up to the challenges using our, our laws as, as one of the, the, um, the tools. Yeah. But we're, we're getting there and I think this latest amendment is, is sort of um, looking forward mm -hmm. on some of the threats on, on species that haven't yet been uh, exploited to the point that Rosewood is. Yeah. And we've listed those and we've put very heavy fines on those as well. Mm -hmm. so, so let's start there. Uh, in your analysis of the uh, law itself and what needed to be inserted or amended, uh, let's talk about what is uh, going to change. Mm -hmm. Your first areas that you spoke about were the penalties. Right. So let's start there. Well, the penalties uh, scale by value of the wood now. In addition to that, it scales by the size mm -hmm. of the offense. Uh, so, for example, if you're caught with, uh, say, a regular pickup, a uh, bag full of, say, mahogany, mm -hmm. um, the, the market value of something like that might be about uh, six, seven thousand, right? So the law intends to triple that as a maximum fine that's applicable to that, to that mm -hmm. offense, triple. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a market value, but triple. So it's similar to what customs does, as we understand it, in terms of charging for contraband goods. Mm-hmm. And... Uh in terms of the persons implicated in the movement of the in of the movement of the timber, mm. um, well, no, the 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 incarceration, the the the, um, the imprisonment period went up from about six months, was it? Yeah, six months mm -hmm. for possession of, of illegal uh, lumber mm -hmm. to one year. Mm -hmm. um, now there is some flexibility that we've seen in in the in the, in the magistrate court, for example, uh, where if someone it's it's their first offence they're usually given just a fine. Mm -hmm. And if you're a repeat offender three, four times, then you might get jail time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at the passage or the amendment of legislation, there has to be enforcement. Mm -hmm. What is being done from the ministry perspective to deal with the enforcement of these laws in terms of either uh, proceeding with prosecution on one end, right. and of course, having uh, rangers and other individuals mm -hmm. in the field to look at what's taking place. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we cannot only look at illegal timber harvest mm -hmm. in isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, we at the Forest Department are actually responsible for several mm -hmm. pieces of legislation, including uh, looking after the forest, the integrity of the forest, but also looking at the biodiversity and the wildlife within these forests. But also we are responsible for administrating the National Protected Area System Act. So we're talking about three um, pieces of legislation, meaning that when we're looking at illegal timber harvest, that yes, for us it is important because it has a significant effect on the local economy, it affects the integrity of the forest, and it has many, many more ramifications um, associated with it. So now, when we now look at law enforcement, we are looking at several things. One, uh, the government has made a significant investment, I must say, um, in as far as the Chiquibul is concerned, through the Chiquibul Forest Investment Initiative, through which the Forest Department will be strengthened in terms of the range of force that we can now hire, mm -hmm. including the equipment that will go along with it. And that enables us to establish greater presence in the conservation posts along the, 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 the Chiquibul, the border that we share with Guatemala, but it also will enable us to establish a couple more. 
in addition to that, we also rely on, 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 on projects that will help us in terms of acquiring equipment, but also in terms of adding personnel. Um, so we're talking about when we look at the general investment that is being made into the forest department specifically, we're talking about an increase of about a third of our staff. A third that will be almost directly focused on compliance management, mm -hmm. which includes law enforcement, but it also looks at engaging communities, engaging the magistracy, engaging other law enforcement agencies in as far as law enforcement is concerned. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, in addition to that, we're talking about how it is that we can network. Network not only with our other government entities, but also with our non-governmental organization partners. Mm -hmm. Presently, um, for instance, the Forest Department, Customs, Fisheries, Police, and BDF are engaged in a, in a global operation, but that is focused locally, an operation that is called um, Operation Thunderbird, where the Forest Department and the Fisheries Departments, as being the agencies that are responsible for regulating the fisheries and forest resource, uh, have focused on hotspots. Mm -hmm. And so through this uh, 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 coordinated approach with these other law enforcement agencies, we have been conducting operations for the past three weeks in terms of targeting these um, these hotspots. And, and I where do you find most of the illegal activity ten tend to take place? Where there's forest. <laughs> so um, <laughs> <laughs> which forest? So, we're so we're talking about the concentration. Is it more of reserves? Is it private property? Is it deep? inland or is it in an accessible area? It's, it's a combination of many things, um, but generally we're talking about the southern part of the country where we have the concentration of forest cover. Yeah. But in the northern portion, for instance, as well, where we have three large forest estates that are privately owned, where we also have a significant uh, illegal poaching, but also focus on wildlife poaching as well. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 whole, the whole issue is that um, it's not Yes, we, it, it's a general geographic area, but it's spread out. Yeah. And by them, the illegal, the people that perpetrate illegal acts being spread out, it also spreads us out, yeah. right? And so it, it's a matter of, of us trying to, to catch up and, and, and being more innovative in terms of the technology that we use in order for us to, 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 to uh, identify where illegal logging is taking place and addressing it. I recall a few weeks ago, several weeks ago, an alarm was raised when it came to uh, illegal logging activity within the Mayflower Bokawina mm -hmm. uh, forest. Is that one of the areas where illegal logging has now become prominent? Well, uh, we've always had um, significant illegal activities occurring in the Mayflower area. Mm -hmm. And it's not over the entire border, there are specific spots um, where the, the, the illegal logging takes place. and. <coughs> That is where we've sought the, um, the help of the community in terms of uh, identifying the individuals. Because intelligence, before we actually act on any mm -hmm. particular operation, is, is important. Um, but in the Mayflower Bukawina area, we were able to work with the um, non-governmental organization, Friends of Mayflower Bukawina, and they were able to give us the information, and we were able to act quickly. Um, we were able to only seize the the material. We were only able to confiscate the lumber. We weren't able to, to apprehend anyone. But in that general area, we do have a case ongoing in terms of individuals actually being caught in the act. Yeah. <coughs> now, Dr. Cho, I think one of the areas that has to be discussed is that obviously <coughs> these, this illegal activity <coughs> takes place with the purpose of making a profit. Um, and I'm not quite sure what the market is locally, but we mm. understand that the purpose of uh, taking down these trees is to transport them out of the country where they get a higher value. Mm -hmm. This is only possible through the cooperation of other persons and some sort of fraud. In other words, you don't have illegal timber leaving the country without some documentation allowing it to get out mm. of the country. Mm. What does the law stipulate for that and for those persons involved? Well, you're very right, Marlene. Um, most of the high-value lumber that is harvested illegally, like rosewood, uh, granadillo, and black poison wood, fetch three or four times higher prices outside than they do here. So the, the temptation to smuggle, is the right word, this material out of the country, 
is very high. And there is certainly an amount of fraud that one needs to, to perpetrate to get mm -hmm. this material out. And uh, to export material, you need permits from several agencies. Mm -hmm. So it, the, the, fraud, the fraudulent uh, activities are very complex. Um, in terms of what the laws currently state, um, in terms of exporting illegal timber, that's one of the areas that I think we need to strengthen mm -hmm. as well. Because the, the current uh, amendments that we just passed um, speak about possession. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're exporting material, it's literally outside of your possession, yeah. if you think about it. So it's simply facilitating. Right. Mm -hmm. So th there is some tightening that needs to be done under the same Forest Act, but it has to do with that, that relates to the exportation of legal wood. But I'll tell you, um, besides uh, fraudulent documents, mm -hmm. uh, there could be... Um, uh, other ways for this material to, to get out. For example, let me just give you, uh, for your viewers, China is one of the, the largest destinations for uh, timber, mm -hmm. illegal and legal. Um, and recently, we, like the chief mentioned, we listed all species of rosewood because there are about 10 or 11 or 12 or even more than that that look very similar yeah. right, in terms mm -hmm. of the, the grain and the quality of the wood. Mm -hmm. And so only three were listed originally on the CITES, meaning that you needed special permits, etc., to export and yeah. trade, um, which meant the other species of rosewood could be exported without CITES permits. Mm -hmm. So what was happening between when those first three were listed and all the others, timber was being exported under some of the, the names that were not listed, mm -hmm. even though they were actually one of the three first listed species. Yeah. And so you get that even today, even without the rosewood, you have other species that look similar. Mm -hmm. And so people are, you know, possibly- Possifying documents. Well, I mean, listing, the yeah. listing the wrong species. Yeah. 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 The documents right. are, could be legit, mm -hmm. okay. right? But inside that container, mm -hmm. there may be another species on as well. Do you yeah. work with customs to be able to uh, assist them in being able to identify the different types of woods? Because being able to stop, I mean, and you're quite right in terms of the stretched resources, when it comes to enforcement, um, and they can be, or they are an important partner for you. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you're, you're hitting the, 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 all the nails on, on the head <laughs> today, and, and that's good, and I think it's a discussion that has to be, to be mm -hmm. spoken out, out in the open. Um, what we're doing right now is strengthening the, the skills of forestry personnel, mm -hmm. as uh, hopefully customs as well, and Baha to identify wood mm -hmm. down to the microscopic level, mm -hmm. right? So it can be ascertained what's exactly inside a container. So that's one of the, um, and we just completed that training last week. Uh, I think we were on channel, one of the news uh, channels. Um, we completed that training. We had several forestry personnel uh, trained up. The idea is to invite customs as well and, and repeat that training. Mm -hmm. um, and that hopefully should address the issue of, of confusing species, both locally, domestically, as well as um, leaving the ports and, and, and leaving the country. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah. and uh, I, I appreciate you pointing out that you've worked with your local staff because it is speculated very often that you must have some people internally who may be assisting when these illegal activities take place. Um, what have you done? And, and this is very important, obviously, being the head of the organization to ensure that your officers understand that you are now taking what seems to be a zero tolerance mm -hmm. policy and uh, will proceed with these more stringent uh, penalties if necessary. Of course, um, I, I think that one must recognize that when we're talking about fraud, coupled with fraud, you're talking about corruption, not only in terms of the overall business partner and, mm -hmm. and other NGO, other um, uh, government stakeholders, but also uh, that may also occur within our organization. And, and that, that we, we need to be clear about that it is recognized. One of the revisions that we did to the actual Forest Act was to also focus on individuals within the organization who may engage in corruption, who may engage in fraud, and there are penalties and also jail time associated with them, if caught, yeah. now having to pay the fine and um, complete that particular sentence. Mm -hmm. So that is, a, for us, a very clear message to not only the Forest Department staff, but to any um, mm -hmm. uh, individual who may want to be enterprising and want to to um, to uh, uh, engage in, in these kinds of activities. Um, now, uh, it is important to mention that 
when we're talking about, as, as Dr. Cho mentioned, fraud and corruption, um, it is evidence-based. And so we need to be very, very uh, vigilant in terms of ensuring that we also probably strengthen our own investigative mm -hmm. capacities because that is next to law enforcement as well and also being able to present a proper case to the magistracy even to the supreme court in terms of of forest crimes yeah. and proper internal structures as i think well. if we can all learn a lesson from what the senate inquiry is pointing out is yeah. that mm -hmm. internal mechanisms yes. are very important mm -hmm. check and ba checks and balances there mm -hmm. we're very quickly much. running out of time and i really mm -hmm. want to get the opportunity to shift into one sec one one uh, issue and that is the forest fire season mm -hmm. yes. has officially opened. Now mm -hmm. one of the things we have learned through our coverage with the hurricanes is that uh, following a storm there is usually a higher risk for forest fires uh, because of fallen trees that haven't been cleared. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's talk about what you're doing as a preventative measure mm -hmm. knowing that this is a possibility. Okay, um, but a little bit before that okay. I just mm -hmm. want to highlight that um, in terms of the legislation that we recently amended there are only six sections that we amended. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, the Forest Department is in the process. Actually, we've, we've, we've issued out a, a tender notice um, for individuals that are concerned to assist us in terms of revising the overall Forest Act legislation. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, from the first section to the last section. So you will do an overall For us to revise it and completely, um, um, if, if need be, to to throw it away and start afresh. And so um, the, 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 um, the amendments that we did were actually just, we, are, we, we don't want to have it seem as though it is a piecemeal approach to solving, a, solving an overall issue, mm -hmm. but it was a necessary step that needed to be, to be taken, but recognizing that we're looking at a much wider revision yeah. of the Forest Act legislation, yeah. um, including other regulations that are attached to it. Um, so, in as far as forest fires um, yeah, are just concerned, just, yes, sir. Um, just before we get there, there's one other thing we wanted to mention is that the uh, grace period, the okay, so-called yes. amnesty period, is finished today. Today is the last day uh, for uh, for people to voluntarily hand in material with no um, questions asked. With no questions asked, exactly. Mm -hmm. So after this, if you are caught, the heavy these fines new apply. Penalties are applicable. Right, sir. And, and the and the legislation is in force. Yeah. Um, it has been enforced since the ninth, okay. right? But we decided to give that grace period. But I, I, I will I will speak a little on, on the on the fire yeah. issue, and, and Dr. Chuck could probably speak on the on the effect of the of the hurricane because he's done quite a bit of, on it. Yeah. Yes, fires. Um, fire season starts February fifteenth, ends June fifteenth. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, it is of a concern to us uh, because we have large swaths of both savanna and broadleaf forest being burnt. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly intentionally especially in the in the savanna areas the, the the pine savanna areas but also through negligent use of fire yeah. um, where uh, we we have agricultural fires being started people not taking the necessary precautions yeah. in terms of when they set a fire and how it is that they, they they look after it importantly though is that come april may we start seeing due to the frequencies frequency of, of fires is that the smoke due to the prevailing easterly to westerly um, um, wind direction we start seeing the Cayo district being affected mm -hmm. by smoke and smog mm -hmm. um, in the morning and well during the entire course of the day mm -hmm. and for us that has important health implications yeah and so we we, we, we continually um, conduct a campaign mm -hmm. along with community um, groups to see how it is that we can engage them in doing what we call controlled burns or controlled burns yeah. so that they uh, meet their purpose in terms of clearing the, the area where they, they normally inhabit, um, but also it meets our purpose in terms of not having fires get out of control and yeah. you know, spread over large areas. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would say three, three things uh, to answer your question. First is um, the department recently completed training for its staff and it's mm -hmm. a brush up training so it's a brush up on their skills uh, firefighting mm -hmm. skills using the equipment etc and responding to fires uh, a couple of weeks ago right chief mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that there's some equipment that was recently donated mm -hmm. to the forestry department to beef up the the uh, resources available to fight fires this season and, and any yeah. subsequent season and third thirdly there is obviously an element of uh, public uh, support uh, public cooperation that is needed because there's two ways fires start 
either naturally by lightning or someone lighting it. So people have to be very careful in using fires uh, during the dry season. And there will be, I believe, advisories going mm -hmm. out yeah. uh, to the public in terms of when the, the conditions are not right for burning yeah. versus uh, pre right. prevailing winds are, are being uh, actually very good. So I, I would say that look out for those advisories. In addition to that, um, there is, um, uh, I think the department can be made available if you call in mm -hmm. and, and ask questions in terms of when to use fire. So. Okay. Well, gentlemen, we're completely out of time, so we appreciate that final tidbit of information because we know, especially people in rural areas, are heavily affected by this. Um, so uh, they can know that you are looking at the situation. Thank you for being here. Uh, and uh, we hope that people are now aware of the fact that the grace period is over, that there are heavier penalties, and that there is more work to take place in terms of uh, overall restructuring of the forest bill, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and take a break. And when we come back, we are going to have a sit-down interview with the new Speaker of the House, uh, Laura Tucker-Longford. Stay tuned.